I wanted to talk a little bit about what has um, inspired me to start this project. And this is very much the initial kind of putting my, putting my toes into the water. Um, the project came out of um, what for a lot of us felt like a year of being under siege. Um, going back to the bushfires of 2019, which my property was kind of in the middle of and which I was waiting at some point whether or not um, I was actually going to be facing it. I was evacuated four times with emergency warnings. Um, that then extended into the pandemic, which seemed to consume most of the year. And because of that, I was spending a lot of time at home, like a lot of us. And it, it kind of made me think about the deepening appreciation I have to the attachment of this place where I find myself. And, but at the same time, feeling that this place is actually increasingly fragile and volatile. It was also the year that I was awarded my PhD and spending a lot of time thinking about the malleability of the voice and the voice's ability to dialogue with physical and acoustic spaces and also with the beings and things that are in that place and to think about and I've been thinking about what would be my next project after my PhD and this is the one that I've kind of landed on. I think um, one of the things that's always fascinated me about the Illawarra is um, its kind of contested histories. My, my house is orientated to look down onto Bulleye Number 2 Mine, which is the, the area that I'm considering or I'm going to be using for the project. And it, um, the land that I live on, was originally used for the pit ponies to graze on. So this house is only really like 40 years old. And before that, there was nothing here other than, um, you know, grazing land and ponies. The um, Middle Heights um, estate, which is um, next to the, next to the Bulleye number two mine, was a very large squatting community that went back to depression years or earlier. And really nobody who lived there had any title to their land until about 15 years ago when it was made into um, a quite affluent gated community that, that is, you know, obviously homes to um, much more affluent people and has a few little vestiges of the original humpies, but generally quite a different kind of place. And I've been able to see a lot of these changes while I've lived here but at the same time, recognising that I'm actually part of the gentrification, that, you know, I'm a creative person that's moved down to this place because it's beautiful and it has wonderful communities. Um, but that I, you know, no doubt, like a lot of people that I know, displaced a lot of people of less, less affluence from the area. And we've seen that kind of change of the nature of who's able to live here and the conditions under which they, they live here over probably the last 40 years, but accelerating, I'd say, in the period that I've lived here. So I know this land is considered to be women's country um, by the local Wadi Wadi people, um, but at the same time, my position of living here without being part of that community is also a contentious thing and something I'm trying to um, understand more of through this project. Um, also, um, the European history of this place has been one of um, connection to mining and of building very strong community connections and often very progressive connections and um, being the home to quite progressive movements like um, the um, campaigns to save Coldar Hospital, which was originally um, built by the the local mining chapter down here, the the um, involvement in more recently the um, coal seam gas, anti coal seam gas um, campaigns around um, mining under the escarpment under the water catchment were extremely big here and and quite um, well organised. So the relationship of mining to this 
region is a very contested one. On the one hand, it helped to form these very strong communities in the northern Illawarra and in the Illawarra generally that were often characterised by very strong sense of community action and mutuality and support of people that um, the itinerant people that came to live in this area um, in the Middle Heights estate were supported by the local community and the um, mining community from being moved on, which they had been moved on quite often and were um, provided with food. Um, I've got lots of local stories of people um, people actually physically supporting and, and, and protecting those communities. But on the other hand, we know that the, um, the Aboriginal owners of the land have been dispossessed and that there's been massive environmental destruction and human costs of the processes of um, mining. And then on top of that, since mining has discontinued, there's been the processes of gentrification. So my interest then is to say, um, and, and I find a lot of resonance with the things that Coralie was talking about, which is about how do we give voice to the voices that um, are less dominant, um, maybe hidden or suppressed or um, maybe voiceless. So how do we give, um, how do we give voice to the environment that is all around us and that we know is, you know, um, under many different kinds of um, threats. How do we um, give voice to the, the history of this place? And a lot of, um, lot of the first stage of this work will be unearthing what those histories actually are. I've got a lot of anecdotal and anecdotal stories and, and things that I've read that just from being somebody who's lived here, you know, I've come to know. Um, and I feel like in some ways what I want to do is actually apply um, both the fields of psychogeography, which is interested in what, what are the histories that are hidden or um, less dominant or not visible of a place. And there's and a lot of that um, kind of practice involves being able to sit in place and listen to place and talk and take time and make space for the unexpected and the unanticipated. So within my paper, I, I talk quite a bit about different psychogeographers that, um, that have given me inspiration with ideas about how to approach what I'm doing. And one of the mo most important ones is Maria Tumarkin, who has done a lot of work on um, looking at trauma escapes, places where terrible things have happened and trying to use the, pra the practice of psychogeography to unearth what those traumas are and to give them voice. And there's no doubt that being able to, at least in my mind, no doubt that giving voice to these contested histories of this place help us to deal with what we're going through right now and help to change us. And, she, and Maria Tamarkin talks quite a bit about how the process of immersing herself in place and in the stories of place have actually transformed her and her approach. But also that it's a way of us recognising the interconnectedness of landscape and history and the idea that the past imbues and infuses the present and that, um, that that knowledge and that deep cellular experience is something that maybe at this point in time is a very important thing. So psychogeography intersects with the emerging fields of um, sound studies and of voice studies in that they both have an interest in the way that sound can investigate the interconnections and dialogues between life worlds and times and that both disciplines have an emphasis on listening to the less dominant, the suppressed and the quiet voices as well as the non-human voices. And one of the things that um, 
is talked a lot by the, both the, um, the researchers into psychogeography and sound studies and voice studies are talking about the importance of developing a listening practice. Some people talk about it as deep listening, which is very much an Aboriginal practice. Others talk about the cosmopolitanism of listening, where we, we, we practice listening to the voices that are not just the dominant voices in our culture, but listening for the ones that are underneath. And I suppose these are some of the things that I want to investigate in this project is how do we listen to a place and how do we listen to the non-human world? And what are the dominant voices? And, and here, I suppose the dominant voices are the voices of development, the voices of um, tourism and industry, and the voices of the non-human world are the ones that are often suppressed or not listened to as much. But it's also the voices of those who are human voices in the landscape that we don't necessarily hear, which are the people that are um, dispossessed, who um, are not actually uh, are marginal within this community because of, um, you know, having access to housing, having access to a place to live. And I'll be talking a little bit later about um, the work of um, Ted Hearn, who in America is kind of specifically dealing with this issue in a sound work, the issue of um, gentrification and displacement and exile, I suppose. And, um, and these seem to be some of the dominant issues of the late 20th century and 21st century. So when we look at, this is this um, photo that you see is actually a photo taken of um, two boys working at Bulleye number two in the early part of the last century. And I love this idea that the past is always with us, that um, may not be an invited visitor, but it's, it's certainly there. And that these resonances of the past imbue the present. And I, I, the sound work that I want to look at will, or that I want to develop, will be investigating those kinds of resonances and how they manifest both visually and orally and in those ways that we can't actually put words to, but it's the feeling of place. Um, so some of the um, interconnections that I'll be considering in the work will be the relationship between European intervention into the landscape and the pre-existing environment. So looking at things like remnants of mining, remnants of orchards that used to be here and feed the, um, the large squatter community, the communities that dotted all this area and the, um, the kind of housing, the changes, what we have remnants of, of humpies, we have remnants of mining cottages that are increasingly disappearing. The relationship between Aboriginal habitation of the landscape and the environment and where we can feel or see that and what we can know about it. The re-emergence of plant and animal life post mining and the resonances of the previous inhabitants and their lives and the communities on this land. And I do acknowledge that I'm right at the beginning of this process, and this is a very broad picture that I'm um, that I'm drawing, and that the process itself will narrow it down, I think. But I, I, I like the idea of starting as broad as possible and then using the practice of um, being in place, and I'll talk more about the process later on to help define what the actual work might be, because at the moment I'm open to really whatever, whatever emerges from, you know, this kind of practice of sitting in place, deep listening, talking, finding, researching, using every resource that's available to find out what actually has been here and still is here. 
Now, this is the part that I'm not sure how it's going to work. Um, uh, it was able to play on my um, laptop, but not necessarily um, here, and it doesn't. I'll just see if I can find another way of getting it to work. So this is a work by a sound artist called Susan Phillips and with this work she won the um, Turner Prize in I think it was about six years ago and there was quite a lot of controversy about the appropriateness of that award but one of the judges said that part of the reason that the prize was awarded was because he, it really gave him a different insight into, into being in place through the use of sound. And as a sound artist, she, um, Phillips talks about the way that sound can explore memory and place. And in that particular um, video, you can hear that the sound of her voice, which is being transmitted through three speakers underneath um, three different bridges, it interacts with the environment and there's a mutuality and speaking to between the environment and, and the voice. She um, describes her songs as sound sculptures, which I, um, I really love. And I'm inspired to see what singing in place, um, as in, in this place, in Bulleye Number 2 in different places, might also reveal about the nature of the environment and its resonances. This piece is a piece by um, Ted Hearn, who's a composer working in New York. And, and as I said, it's, um, it's exploring the impacts of gentrification through 19 songs combining um, jazz, indie rock, modern classical, electronic and spoken word. And a quote from him about this, this project was that he started, he says, I started thinking about how could this neighbourhood be mapped differently? If I looked on Google Maps, I could see it one way, he says. But if I could start to understand the cartography in deeper ways that were more related to the experiences of everyone who was living around me and had lived in that neighbourhood and the history of the neighbourhood, what greater understanding could I come to in that neighbourhood? And what would that sound like? if I tried to map that in music. So I suppose in a, that's a very grand aim, but that's the direction that I'm, I'm hoping to go in. So this is um, an excerpt from Place. 
Last question, I think. Um, how would you how would you define home? How would you define like from an alien planet were to ask you what characterizes home? Like what? Um, the place where um, the place where I let my guard down. where I'm, I don't think about. The place where I'm, I don't think about, the place where I don't think about myself at all. And uh, the, the, and, uh, the, the, and uh, the, the place where I don't. Um, Present. Present. I'm so, I'm so, I'm so, I'm so. Last question, I think. So the next steps for me will be um, I have some existing connections with the um, Aboriginal Land Council and I want to talk to them about a process that I could undertake in research in this place that um, honours the um, Aboriginal occupation and, and history in this place of um, 60,000 years. Um, and I also want to, um, as part of that process, immerse myself in the site. I have permission from the current private owner that I can come onto the site at any point. Um, so my plan is to every day choose a different point of the day and spend time walking through it, sitting and listening, recording sound, filming the site at different parts of the day, and then the other part of the process will be interviewing um, people that I know have a deep connection to the place or understanding of its history and working through um, Wollongong Library and seeing what kind of archival information there might be. And I'm thinking that that process will take about three months, but may take longer, it might be shorter. And I'm hoping at the end of it to have some ideas of a way forward for the kind of work that I could be part of in getting going that would honour all the different histories and resonances of this place that I love and have a deep connection to. And I didn't say, but one of the things that I really love about psychogeography in particular is that it honours um, the personal and it honours the local and that is actually the starting point for the work that I'm doing but obviously in doing that it has lots of interconnections and resonances that are much broader than that. So thank you. Okay, thanks so much, Karen. Um, so we'll hand over to Elizabeth now, who's gonna respond. Well, thank you, Karen. That was really fantastic. And I really, really appreciate your, um, your presence within the work that you're talking about. And I'm very interested in how you sort of negotiate. Um, and I think you mentioned in one of your writings that your mother is a, 
Wiradjuri woman, if I hope I said that right, from Peak Hill, and that this is a different place from the place that you're actually exploring now of the Wadi Wadi people. And I'm very interested in how you negotiate that displacement in yourself. Yeah. And it seems to me that this is a part of the work that you're actually doing because you also live there and you feel that you are part of the gentrification, and yet you are also very aware of the union movement, you're very aware of the history, you're very aware of what this place has meant to people over, you know, 40,000 years, do you know what I mean? And this is what you're actually trying to negotiate and I find that really, really fascinating. I'm also interested in the concept of voice and sound and that they can be sort of sometimes, we sometimes use the word voice in terms of new materialism to understand the world beyond the Anthropocene, that, that it has a voice, that there is a voice within the, the culture, within ecology, ecosystems, that there are voices within there. And I think it's really interesting, the thought of bringing those out mm. through your work. And also, of course, your own understanding of voice being a wonderful singer, which you are, um, and the fact that you can actually use a voice as an embodiment of, of the world outside of you as well as using your voice from the embodiment from within and I find that I find that interesting the juxtaposition between those two things and the other thing that I think is very interesting about the voice and listening to that work of <clears throat> Susan Phillips is that it immediately evokes an empathy mm. and I remember I, I do think that sound work has a really wonderful way of um, sort of bringing out empathy and bringing empathy for the people who are part of it. And I, I remember I, I gave a lecture many, many years ago about sound and somebody asked me from the audience, what did I feel was the political impact of sound? And I remember I, I probably would be thinking about that now in terms of empathy and in terms of an understanding that through empathy, one can understand the, the, some of the political systems and the subversive systems that you're trying to negotiate. Um, in particular, you're interested in class and the way that and the way the actual concept of this place has changed over this time over these this time and also of course climate change and the um, the actual world that we're trying and as you say you want to protect the world and restore it and and your concept of fire in um, in that particular area mm -hmm. and then of course the indigenous people going way back you know, I feel that this this sense of respect and awe for the for the place that we stand on, and I think the other thing that really interests me about sound and voice is that it many many sounds and many voices can can occupy the same time, so they can actually occur simultaneously. Mm -hmm. So that whereas we tend to think of um, of history as being a sort of series of events, one which causes the other, and we look back and try to understand. In fact, what sound can do is actually really put things on a vertical level and have them occurring simultaneously. And I think as we walk and as you walk around on, on the land, there are all these histories there. And, and I feel that what you're saying is that through sound and through voice, you actually want to bring those out and you can bring them out simultaneously through using sound because sound can occupy a lot of different spaces and create, I think what Bergson calls a sort of duration through a number of fluxes and a number of events occurring simultaneously. So that would be my response and thank you. Beautiful, Elizabeth. Yeah, uh, yeah. I, as you speak, I, I, I realise the kind of enormity of what it is that I'm trying to do. And, and it, I know it's enormous and, and seems impossible. But, but as I said, I think I always start that way with anything that I do. I think really broad and then see where which, which theme actually starts to become, to resonate with me, that feels like the direction to go. And it's exciting for me because I've never really created a work of my own. Um, you know, I've sung lots of other people's works. Mm. And it's going to be something that I'm going to create, you know, no doubt with lots of other people and, you know, using lots of other people's skills. But the idea that this is, this is going to be, I suppose, my voice too, you know, my voice as, as somebody with something to say.
you know. Um, yeah, well, when I when I heard that work of Susan Phillips, I realised that that was something that you were wanting to explore was your own voice inside this larger. Yeah, yeah, larger. and also that um, that voice can can be or my voice can be in any place, and that is actually transformed by wherever I am, and that I'm transformed by the experience of hearing my voice in that place. So I think I think that's something that I'm very interested in being mostly, you know, the kind of singing that I've done has been in very specific environments designed to for the voice to be heard in very particular ways. What is it like to take the voice out of that context and put it somewhere else? Um, yeah. see. Okay, okay, so we might uh, see if there are any other questions. We'll open it up, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Great. Thank you, Elizabeth. Any other questions for Karen? I haven't really got a question, <laughs> but I was just noticing, it was thank you very much, Karen, that was great. And I think it was really interesting what you said to Elizabeth. Um, and so thanks for that. Um, yeah, it was just sort of interesting of you going into a place and um, trying to, and it reminded me of, um, in a writing, a, a contrast, a writing project that David Haskell did where he, went and sat with particular trees yeah. and kind of wrote about, have you ever read or any of his work? No, but I, I just thought, yeah, it might be, I mean, I just thought it might be an interesting thing because it's, it's, he wrote the story of the place and looked at the sort of changes across time and, and what the tree was doing culturally and what, what the tree meant, you know, a tree at the centre of the gate of Jerusalem or a tree in a deep forest and it was just a really interesting project so you're you're kind of using your area to do that and I suppose I just you mentioned the Indigenous elders and I thought well you know thinking about songs and song lines how will you deal with that aspect of what you're entering into and in our connection with place in terms of that Indigenous kind of relationship? Yeah um I suppose what one of the things that um, I'll be talking to, um, you know, elders from the area about is what is it okay to know and what is it not okay to know and what is it okay to talk about and what is it, you know. So I, I think all of those things, like I, I know certain things about this area, but I don't know whether I should be talking about them, you know. So, so I suppose all those kinds of permissions and dialogues about what, what should be known and what can't be known and also for what purpose, you know, because I suppose my, I, I want to really acknowledge that, you know, we're a blip on the history of this place really, you know, and that, you know, down at Sandon Point, um, you know, um, at Thirul, they you know, they found, you know, burial sites for clever men that were going back like 60,000 years. So, you know, it seems like for us to be just talking about the 200 years that that have been here, you know, of European settlement certainly has had incredible impacts, but, but seems, yeah, there's, there's much deeper thing happening. I, I suppose yeah. it's just, it's interesting thinking of song because when you're thinking of writing, you know, as a, yeah, no, I suppose it's just, you're sitting at a very interesting. Um, yeah, I, I yeah I, I feel that too. I feel that, um, you know, is it right for me to have access to songs from this area? I don't know, you know, and I'd have to talk and, and, and maybe I'm not the one to do it. Maybe it's somebody else to do it, you know, and I facilitate that, you know. I'm open to the idea that there are all sorts of things that could happen that maybe not appropriate for me to be involved in, but that might, that maybe I could open up a space for them to happen. Um, that's what I'm thinking. I, I'm not even sure who will be, I, I don't think it's a project I'll do on my own, but I'm not quite sure who will come up out of what I'm doing that would like to be, you know, partners or collaborate. I was going to say a collaboration. Yeah, I think it will be a beautiful thing for a collaboration. Yeah, I think it would be, and I think um, you know because I've, for instance, met there. There's a there's the remnants of the old. Um, um, it's called the Miners Lamp Choir, and they were originally you know they go back 
quite a way and they they sing mining hymns, you know, and they're based in um, Coromel. And I'm thinking that could be a possibility. I don't know, you know, but, and also, you know, the stories that I've got, I'd want to record them, but there are some amazing stories of things that have happened here that I've been told by, you know, neighbours and people that I've met in the area, you know, that inspire me. And, and I think, oh, what a, what a beautiful story of, you know, community or mutuality. And I suppose that's part of my agenda too, is thing, uh, contrasting that history with what I feel is quite a different history developing now and particularly under current sort of political um, political influences where, um, you know, we're encouraged more and more to see ourselves as, you know, isolated individuals, only responsible for it ourselves and our own economic position. And but that did, doesn't seem to be the history of this place at all, you know. So, so that's part of what I'm interested in. I, I want to bring that history out because I think there's a lot of beauty and there's sadness and there's there's all kinds of things there. But to me, there's a lot of a lot of beauty in it. Um, time for maybe very one very quick question. Um, I'm just gonna, yeah, I, we might move on. Um, I'll just say, and I'll put this in the chat as well, Karen. Um, I just read a book, uh, judging a prize, uh, for a, for a prize judging, um, task, um, a book by a scholar called Joseph Cummins, which is, uh, called something like the imagined, imagining the sound of, like, uh, the imagined sound of Australian literature and music. Anyway, he has this whole kind of thesis about, um, imagined sound which he takes from, um, uh, what's his name, Benedict, Benedict Anderson, uh, that's the famous, you know, the sort of famous idea of an imagined communities and thinking about that through sound. And although he's kind of talking, I mean, he's talking about music as well as, as literature, so I think it might be something that you might be interested in looking at. So I'll put it in the chat anyway. Um, and we should move on because we're kind of running.